Welcome to Business News and Other Shit. I'm your host, Amr Abdullah. Thank you for listening. Today on our show, we have John Friedland. <sighs> Woo! How you doing, John? I'm okay. Okay. You look frozen in time right now. <laughs> I don't know what that means. <laughs> I don't know either. What's up, man? Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. We also have St. James Jackson. Yo. My boy. Welcome back from New York City. Thank you. Where you did some great sets. Yes, it was very fun. I was following fun. you, watching you. Kill it, baby. Thank you, bro. So proud of you, man. Thank you, man. Appreciate yeah, you. Yeah, man. God bless you. Thank you. St. James. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Greatness. What's up? What's up? How you doing, man? I'm okay. Good. I'm here. Good. Uh, you're really bending over to talking that mic. Yeah, let's get you. There you go. There you go. That's Better right, posture. baby. There we go. I like it. Uh, thanks for being here, Investment Posse. You're welcome. How's your uh, swag? How's your uh, s- swag stash going? Um, it dropped a little bit this week. Your swag fund dropped a little bit. Oh yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll see if we can hook you up there. Thanks. And C to the B. Welcome back, Chris Bradhead, producer of the year. Yo, yo, what it is, you jab turkeys? How you doing, uh, man? Uh, I have been better. Listeners, to be if you aged. Yeah, what's that? To be aged. To be aged. I have no idea what that means. It's to be honest, but with uh, an TBH. Yeah, I end. got you. I got you. Uh, yeah, to our listeners, if you suddenly I don't hear Chris for like five minutes, he's definitely gone to the bathroom because he has a stomach bug. Oh, I thought you were saying I'm doing good. B I T C H. I mean, that was the quickest <laughs> way I've heard somebody say I'm bitch in a while. B I T C H. <laughs> Uh, welcome to the podcast, guys. We're going to uh, have a good one here today. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about... So it ain't going to start out too fun, uh, unless we can try and make it fun. But uh, we, I cannot ignore everything happening in Sri Lanka this week. Uh, it's been weighing heavy on my heart, so we're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, and if any, what impact might that have on the world of money and finance? Uh, then we're going to talk to John Friedland. We're going to jump right into it and talk to you, my man. Um, and then we're going to talk about the stock market. Actually, we're going to flip-flop those. We're going to talk about the stock market and the record we're having. Stock market is an all-time record high, y'all, y'all, y'all. We're going to talk to John, our main man, one of the top bankruptcy attorneys in the city of Chicago, maybe the country. I might argue this man has kind of written the book on bankruptcy law. Uh, We're going to talk about stock market and all the crazy stuff going on in there, and then John, and then finally, Facebook. Um... What, what used to be a dumpster fire is now turning into a wrecking ball of a building that needs to go down for some reason. It's like a dump truck fire now. Dump truck fire. Ah. <laughs> uh, so uh, let's uh, let's jump into it a little bit, guys. So, yeah, so I don't have a specific business direct link to this Sri Lanka issue. It's really just I can't ignore what happened. Uh, and it's just been weighing on me. I've been thinking about it all week. And if it's on my mind... I feel like I need to address it. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, it's kind of just sitting there somewhere in my subconscious, you know. So this is like a therapy session for you. If you don't mind, Dr. Freeland. Uh, okay. You can, you're, 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 what you guys don't know about John, I met John two years ago. Happy anniversary, baby. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> when he, uh, he used to work at Netflix, John Freeland, and. Um, what? Yeah, he got fired for dropping the N- N-word twice. Man. It's a different John Friedland. Oh, that's a different John Friedland? Yes. I thought that was you, man. Can we still be friends? <laughs> <laughs> Ask St. James, not me. <laughs> that's funny. So has it really been two years then? It has been about two years. Oh, okay. I met John uh, through a... Uh, I, I was um, in the process of possibly buying a coffee chain here in Chicago out of bankruptcy. And John showed up like an angel at the doorstep. And it was just... Really helpful to work with John in that. So that's why that's why we really hit it off. And John, more than just helping me with that, I mean, he became a good friend. He's a good family man. I have strong feelings about John as a good dude. Very creative guy from the legal side. Um, yeah. Remember that you're married. Oh, okay. okay. Ignore, uh, that. Ignore that. I just that's said funny. All that I, I honestly thought you were like, things we didn't know about John, he's Jewish. I'm like, oh, shit, I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, I you know, growing up, I had mixed feelings about mixed all mixed up feelings about Jewish people and Palestinian. Ooh, oh, right? I say pick your words wisely. <laughs> 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 I had mixed up feelings. Then I met John, and I was like, 
this is why it's hard for me to get along with Jewish people. Uh, <laughs> was I the first shit. Jew you ever met? First time ever. Can you believe can, it? Can You're kidding. Ad- I am kidding. Can okay. we acknowledge how more edgy this podcast has got since first time I came in? We was actually like by the book. We did tiptoeing. Talk. Yeah, Walking you were up. all out now, man. What oh, happened? Oh, yeah. What's up, baby? <laughs> you came on the show. After that show, it all changed. <laughs> I've been on the show three times. <laughs> you can't be all me. It was ever since we got Nishad. Yeah, yeah I was going to say. Yeah. Nishad. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Nishad changed the game. We had this guy Nishad on who just completely, um, basically, you know, he, he, I think he had a stomach bug that day and diarrhea all over the show. And out of his mouth. Good way or bad, bad way? Good way, right? Uh, we had to delete a lot of that podcast, actually. That's funny. Well, we had, we had my 19-year-old intern on the show. because Oh, that was the show I was at, right? I was showing oh, her yeah. the ropes, and I was like, man, no other shows are like this. <laughs> <laughs> but no, seriously, yeah, it's been nice. Uh, I'm Palestinian. John's Jewish. Uh, John's a great man, a great friend. I've learned a lot from you from a business perspective, but also inviting me to some concerts. Um, John has supported me. He's come to some comedy shows of mine. That's what's up. So we've we've become good friends. John's a, is a, d- a dear friend. We've met we've met each other's families. So it's great. I like John a lot. So he gave you notes on your comedy? Uh, no, but he tried to uh, take me to court for some of the performance. I uh. it was that bad. <laughs> John, you're unusually silent through all this. <laughs> You're saying nice things about me. Just listen. Oh, okay, yeah. good. Take it in. I feel the same way about you. Sri Lanka. So three churches were were bombed by three suicide bombers and three ho- I believe suicide bombers and then three hotels were also bombed. Right. This is nothing. No laughing matter. Uh, well over 300 people died, and well over 400 people were wounded. All right. So this is a very very serious attack. Um, and, you know, when I heard about it right away on Sunday, Easter, this was on Easter in mm-hmm. Sri Lanka. That's awful. Sri Lanka is an island, right? And th- these attacks occurred all over different parts of the island. Mm-hmm. So it was quite coordinated. Just sick. Um, and it's just, I tried to ignore it on Sunday when it happened on Easter. I'm like, that, I just can't even think about that. And so I totally was avoiding, ignoring mm-hmm. it. You know, I'm just like, I don't want to feel this. I don't want to feel this. And then Monday I woke up, I'm like, what am I doing? I can't ignore this. You know, so I, so I looked into it and I read it and I was like, oh, man, it just weighed on me. It just killed me. And ever since the, the, the New Zealand attacks as a Muslim and the Tree of Life synagogue attacks in Pittsburgh uh, four months before New Zealand, it was something about Tree of Life and then New Zealand that had a huge impact on me. And I was like, I'm not taking these seriously enough. Like, they're not, like, when, when, the, Muslim, when the New Zealand one happened, it was just like, I was, like, was kind of stunned almost paralyzed i wasn't thinking straight i didn't feel right i was messed up for a couple of days uh i think becoming a father has had that impact in the last six months i have a second child in the last six months and um and so yeah so when the sri lanka one hit it just hit me really hard i'm like yeah i'm taking these things more seriously so i couldn't i couldn't ignore them uh, why wasn't he taking uh desensitized i think bit? numb yeah. i think no i think it was just happening one after the other after okay. the other, all these shootings mm-hmm. and schools and all this other yeah. stuff and I was just like, oh, I know how to handle this. I'll just go numb for the next whatever number of yeah. shootings. And that's like what happened for a long time, you know? I, I, I think it happens to a lot of us. I, I do, too. Uh, I think about all the uh, people who get killed by cops, which is not the same at all. But at this point, I'm kind of used to it. And it's not mm. not even like I'm not even trying to like play victim. It's just like a weird thing to be like, oh, another one. Or yeah. even like the crimes in bad neighborhoods, you just see all these people getting killed. I'm like, oh, it's just this is what happens in Chicago, which it doesn't necessarily have to be that way. But you hear so much of it, you think you start to think you don't have any control of it. And in this case, we have no mm. control of it, mm. but we can always do something. So I feel you on that. Right. I mean, you kind of it's good to be aware that you shouldn't be like this shouldn't be a normal thing we're used to. Exactly. Mm-hmm. If nothing else, like saying a prayer, you know, exactly. what I'm saying? Pray, praying for the dead, that their souls, you know. Mm-hmm. Their souls are are are. Well, just speaking revered. up on the podcast, like you're doing, this is <laughs> right. This is something exactly. You know, that's exactly right. So, uh, so yeah, I, I don't know. Maybe it's me becoming a dad or whatever. But that's that's the difference I felt. Um, and so then it came out, right? ISIS, Islamic State, came out and said, you know, we take responsibility for this. That was our attack. Who knows if it's true or not? Let's take it at face value. They say that they're they say that they did it. Fine, they did it. What's coming out? What, what's what's laughing at? This is awful. What? <laughs> But I used to sound like that kid that was like forgot to do his homework, but like the rest of the team did the project. But he's like, hey, but I was in the group, so <laughs> technically, give me credit. Yeah, I get a little credit for this, you know. <laughs> that's a bad thing to be. That's a bad thing. But I thought that's like, oh yeah, I used to right. ain't even doing shit, man. People blowing up other shit, and they just taking credit for it. Yeah, it's, 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 it's like they got the brand for it. You know what I'm saying? They could just say they did it, and people are like, yeah, they did it. 
And, and governments love to blame it on them because then the yeah. government doesn't have to take exactly. responsibility. Mm -hmm. Like in this case, right? In this case, well, we'll talk about that in a moment, about how the government, I think, dropped the ball on this. Uh, but first of all, right, ISIS comes out and says, yeah, that's retribution for New Zealand. That's why we did that. Mm. What's coming out is it's local Sri Lankan Muslims who may have done it. That's the early investigation, right? Or at least people who claim they're Muslim. Um, so, you know, I look at the situation, I'm like, really, ISIS? Like, you're saying that's revenge for New Zealand? New Zealand was a historic moment, in my opinion, from like a Western, you know, Western folks and Muslim folks. Mm -hmm. It was historic, right? You have Jacinda Ardern, the prime minister, uh, do, bending over backwards to make sure uh, all, all the dead were revered and respected all the muslims who you know who who the survivors were, were were honored she wore a hijab to the uh the ceremony and the memorial um i mean i i can't think of any western country that's handled an attack like that better than her mm -hmm. regardless if it was muslim victims or not so i mean like she revered the dead in a in a powerful way the, the whole government did like the sovereign wealth fund of new zealand the people who manage the new zealand money they're like yo we've already uh pulled money from, we're considering pulling money from all the social media platforms that helped cause this or helped promote this. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're asking them to hold, you know, be accountable for uh, broadcasting this man's killings, you know. Um, but then also, like, she came out and was like, yo, we, we protect all Muslims' rights. Uh, we protect all human beings' rights. Um, they just, New Zealand as a government bent over backwards to, like, give a big warm hug to the Muslim community who lost a lot of people in that New Zealand tragedy. And ISIS's response was, we're, we're trying to get you back, New Zealand. Like, we're getting you back for this. I mean, that, that just doesn't, doesn't make any sense to me. Like, if ever you wondered if ISIS is full of crap, right, this is the moment. Mm -hmm. It's so obvious to me that th they're not do they're not, doing this to protect like muslims rights like mm -hmm. new zealand did that you know what i mean like like they did honor the muslims and this is how you responded like no you you're doing this for yourselves isis mm -hmm. for whatever political crazy power you know uh, distortion of the religion that you have that's why you're doing this isis not not to protect muslims i mean come on now you know what i mean like i, I just don't buy that um so that's my my first reaction was just like you know ISIS, I think you're less for Muslims. I think, and I, I just, for people who are anti-Muslim, who, who do think ISIS is about like, you know, uh, we represent Muslims and we, you know, I, I don't, I, I wanna tell like anyone who's anti-Muslim that's listening to this is like, look at, look, ISIS is uncovered in this example. The moment they said it's revenge for New Zealand, it's like, that can't, that, that doesn't make sense, right? Like, how could this be revenge for New Zealand, when New Zealand did such a great job um, caring for the Muslim situation, right? So it's like ISIS clearly. How, how do Muslims feel about ISIS? I mean, if you ask me, I, I can speak for me. I can't speak for all Muslims, right? Mm -hmm. um, but like, this is a great example of looking at ISIS and be like, "Wait, you, you're you're trying to say you represent you represent me, ISIS? Mm -hmm. You know, like, like now you you know you don't." Going to kill all those people it, as a revenge for New Zealand? Like, I want, no, I want nothing to okay. do with that. You know okay. what I'm saying? I think most people have kind of realized ISIS is a, 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 a band of thugs. Okay. Like that's what they are. Okay. That's you know a, what I'm saying? Just a criminal. A gang. Play right. devil's advocate. Um, if it's stated that, that uh, Sri Lanka was revenge for New Zealand, I don't think it was stated in a way... Uh, in the following way. This is revenge against the government and people of New Zealand. I don't think anyone said that. All I've heard is this is revenge for New Zealand. Right. That could simply be shorthand uh, for this is revenge against the specific people who committed those atrocities in New Zealand. And this is our statement to the world that the next time atrocities are committed this is what we're against do. our people, we will strike back against yours. Um, not defending ISIS, but I mean, just as a logical matter, I, I wanted to point I that agree. out. I agree. Who, who is who is ISIS's target, for example, right? I mean, I always think of ISIS as target 
is not like the Christian religion. I actually think ISIS's target typically is like the West, quote unquote. It's the the Western world. New Zealand is is one of the classic Western countries, like New Zealand, Australia, UK, Canada, Western Europe, America, yeah, yeah. obviously, you know. So I, I'm I'm just looking at the situation. I'm like, I'm like, hey, ISIS, wait a minute. You got a Western country here who bent over backwards to protect their their revere and protect the Muslims in their country after this tragedy in New Zealand. And you're saying, oh, you're getting you're getting the you're getting the New Zealand you know you're getting the West back for what they did, but they did a great job. But again, responding. It, you're begging the question. Um, uh, no, I'm saying I'm if, assuming if, it's the West, I'm right? Assu- I'm but assuming, assuming it was those people who ever committed the atrocities, then you know that that's just different. Yeah, if, if ISIS is targeting just that one dude who committed the atrocity, would, would and, well, it's targeting every would be dude who's thinking about committing oh, atrocities you. against Muslims in the future, saying, yeah. you know, you do that, this is what will happen. Right. You take out one of ours, we'll take out ten of yours. Right, 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 right. I, I mean, it, it could be that's how ISIS is thinking, that they're, they're just talking to the would-be attackers. You know, it seems to me they want to take over, like, political powers. They want to take over Western power. You know, they, they have these grandiose ambitions, it seems to me, to destroy the West, the classic 9-11, you know, um, uh, tragedy, right? Mm-hmm. They want to knock out Western targets, mm-hmm. right? So I think about the ISIS's target more as that. And so what I would say to it, if the, so assuming that's the target, is Western targets or just the West in general, this is an example where if someone's anti-Muslim in America, let's say, and they see ISIS saying it's revenge for New Zealand, I would want, I would invite that anti-Muslim person to be like, wait a minute, I saw New Zealand bend over backwards to support Muslims in New Zealand. You know, ISIS is just a hypocrite. Like, if anything, ISIS should have been like, well done, New Zealand, thank you. Now we, we have you, finally, one Western country supporting Muslims, great. We'll make sure not to have any retribution. So that's what I'm saying. Is you're you. right. It depends on who the target is, but I would say the target is kind of Muslim, is is kind of Western, Western countries. The second point in this, and we'll, we'll wrap up after this, is the following: from a business perspective, actually, or a money perspective. So there was a so so there was a, a Buddhist attack in Sri Lanka on Muslims, right? So some some Buddhists attacked Muslims. The government did nothing about it. What they was this? This was, I think, a few months prior mm. to the Easter. It's in Myanmar. No, that w- the Rohingya. That's different. That's, that's different. Yeah. yeah, yeah. This was a different Buddhist uh, uh, attack, and uh, and then so the government did nothing about it. They just sat on their hands. Then, the United States and India warned Sri Lanka ten days ago about, hey, churches are being targeted. Be on the lookout. The government did nothing about it. So the government had some heads up about this terrorist attack, all right? Yeah, and they just sat on hand. So there's two issues in a matter of a few months that the government is just sitting on their hands. It's like, well, what what are you doing if you're not responding to the Buddhist attack, and you're not you, you didn't do anything when you didn't respond to the American and Indian warnings about the churches? Like, what are you doing? You've been pre-warned. It's sick. And I just it, it reminds me of how a lot of governments and countries are set up these days. Mm-hmm. It's like they don't seem to be operating effectively under our quote-unquote democracies. You know what I'm saying? It, it seems to me that America's doing great. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> Things <laughs> are aligned. Were you going to say something? I, I was. It sounds like to me you're advocating totalitarianism. Uh, as more dictator? Efficient, you need as a more dictator? Efficient. No, I'm just saying that the way the current democracy is set up, right? The way the current democracy... Things are... Uh, regulations or laws are not coming into play to impact governing in a way that protects the people. It seems to me that a lot of focus, whether it's United States, Sri Lanka, pick your country, because a lot of a lot of governments are are lined up and aligned the way the United States is, um, where where money and power are really the focus as you enter into government and politics, the lobbying. Um, that, that just becomes the primary focus. And that's one point I make on this podcast all the time is like, yo, I'm sorry, but the way our government is set up, things are aligned so that businesses have the most power in this country. Yeah. And stock markets, the Federal Reserve and the United States government will do whatever's in their power to make sure those stock markets keep going up. That's been happening for hundreds of years, over 100 years. 
I believe is going to continue to happen until some sort of big change happens. Is, Look, is there a way to invest that like decreases that? That decreases what? The amount of power that businesses have. Uh, no, I don't. I'm not that I can think of. Yeah. You're saying basically make an investment where you bet that. No, I'm corporate- saying invest so that invest in companies that don't have all that power and are ah. like evil as as f. I mean, no. The best thing I got right now is social investing, conscious, socially conscious investing, where you just, you know, you, you invest, you, you vote with your dollars in a way where you don't, for example, put money into, I don't know, Monsanto, or you don't put your money into um, Boeing, for example, with, with how they, I think, have flubbed the whole Max 8 thing. Yeah. But yeah, to, yeah, so. So anyway, that's, that's the second point I have here is like, Sri Lanka, like, what are you, what are you doing? Like, like, what? Why isn't this a huge priority? Like, you just falling asleep at the wheel. I think it's just the way power is set up right now. Also, we just I've noticed uh, we have government set up to be reactive instead of proactive. I don't know why that's the case. I think it's a fear. Uh, I don't know. I just noticed like a government is has been set up for the most part of everything. I don't know that much about government, but they're just always pro. Not pro. They're always reactive. They mm-hmm. wait for something to happen, and then, of course, then they make the changes. So I think that's just always been the way it is. I, it, this is part of, part of my point, which is, like, the way it's set up, um, in order to, for example, win an election as a lawmaker, mm-hmm. the dude who's going to make the laws and try and be proactive, mm-hmm. he's getting bombarded mm-hmm. with lots of lobbyists, lots of requests mm-hmm. for um, making laws. Of course. But they're all laws based on, uh, not all, but the majority are, um, let's see, corporate related mm-hmm. law changes mm-hmm. and lawmaking you know um I, I i'm experiencing the united states that way and, and much of the world that, that that's way as well. not true because do you remember you're the, a lawyer you know better than me yeah remember the cartoon schoolhouse rocks and <laughs> you know how a bill became a law i'm just a bill. Bill. oh you don't know that <laughs> no. a bill oh, you know. on capital to oh, yeah, i'm sorry you know it Oh, everybody, everybody knows, knows that. Oh, I missed it. You didn't grow up in the United States. You grew up in Canada, right? <laughs> no, no, no you didn't even grow up in Canada. I grew up here. I thought you grew up in Canada. No, I just no. lived there for a couple of years. Oh. Well, maybe, I don't know why he knows it and you don't. Yeah, uh, I know. You know? yeah, Robert still know says it. a boot, though. A boot. A boot. <laughs> but anyway. Um, so, yeah, tell me. Well, I, I was just trying to make sort of a little cultural reference joke because yeah. in that cartoon... It was like a it was a Saturday morning sort of sure. like five minute. It, it came in between main shows like a commercial, mm-hmm. and um, they were very well done. Some old jazz singer I think was was the singer, ah. and it was on all these different topics. And the most maybe the most famous one is I'm just is the the one that shows how a bill becomes yeah, the law, yeah, mm-hmm. and it started with like Bobby in some local community having an idea, so he wrote his senator or whatever. Mm-hmm. And then they showed, you know, in six minutes, the process of how that bill became a law. Mm. The little civics lesson. So that's my evidence that um, <laughs> laws co- can come, you know, for peop- from people for people. But uh, as the process works, right, with a whip and the votes and, you know, conservatives versus Republicans as they're vying for, uh, you know, packages, is it necessarily the case that if Bobby puts forth a law to, for example, um, make our government more proactive towards school shootings, um, that Bobby's law will definitely get passed? No, of course not. That, that's <laughs> my point, man. Yeah. That's my point, you know? It's almost like the, the citizens know how the process works and how power works, and so Bobby's like, why the, why the hell should I put forth a law when I'm, I'm getting nowhere with it? So I think it ends up um, kind of like deflating a lot of citizens. Well, I mean, you could look at the um, the statistics about how many, what percentage of the eligible population votes in any election, city, right. state, or or federal elections. Right, and, and you're very saying, small. Yeah, they're small. You're saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right. Wait, small people vote? Is that what you're saying? All the small people vote. They all they all vote. Hundred <laughs> percent turnout. Um, yeah, you're right. Min- min- probably a minority of citizens vote. Yeah, you know, I mean, I don't know the exact statistics. I know it's it's a heck of a lot less than yeah. 100%. Like five oh, yeah. foot and under? Or? <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> um, so yeah, that's the other thing about Sri Lanka is like these things came in, this information was coming in, and attacks were happening with Buddhists and whatnot, and they, they just kind of to be fair to them. What do you do? What it, that's such a broad um, like information like, like the churches are being attacked. Do you put security guards at churches? Like how do you? It's one idea for sure. Yeah. that's an obvious one. Yeah. But I think the more obvious one is. Um, Okay, America. Okay, India. Yeah. Where are you getting this information that's, from? That's what oh, well, we got it from this phone call from this. All right, go go, flesh out those leads. Yeah, you know, put a bunch of men on those, you know, or women on those. Put a bunch of investigators on those mm-hmm. leads. And it just sounds like they did none of that. Mm-hmm. Nothing. They okay. Just didn't react to it at yeah. all. Yeah, that is pretty bad. Right, right. So, so that's Sri Lanka. Stock market. Thank you, Yahya. The stock market is at an all time. Record high. Really? Rich getting okay. richer. The S&P 500 is at 2930, 2930 right now. The S&P 500, this collection of the 500 largest American companies, um, is at an all-time record high, as is the NASDAQ. I don't think the Dow is there, but it's almost there. Um, but in general, stocks, man, they're just killing it right now. Okay. And it ain't by accident, in my opinion. Um, Let me ask you this. This yeah. is dumb, but I just, I really... I love dumb questions. All right, good. This is a good one. Can you, make it, can you make it dumber than you thought it was going to be? All right, I got you. Because this is a pretty dumb question. Does it question. make you sound smart? Absolutely. Okay. Would it be smarter? This is just... In theory, is would it be smarter for a kid who's going to college, instead of going to college, put all that money into the stock market? Absolutely. Absolutely. I fully... Ab- Okay, wait, no. Let me answer more accurately. It depends on what college the kid can get into. Okay. If he can get into a Harvard, a Stanford, University of Chicago, Northwestern. Just say middle. Middle? middle. Yeah. Man. Just say like a DePaul or what's a a Northwestern. I mean, Northwestern's pretty good. I'm scared to say this, but I'm pretty much like 90% like, yeah, that person should. Mm -hmm. I mean, the way our government is set up, the way they they boost up the stock market, um, the way education is now uh, more readily available. Exactly. You know? Uh, How do you feel about college? Like I said, if, if it's a top school, of it course. makes sense to go. It's going to open up a lot more doors than normal. Mm-hmm. Uh, but an average school... So like an Ivy League school, like correct, the top, top. Okay. Correct. But an average school, because average schools now cost 30, 40 grand mm-hmm. a year, you're going to put an 18-year-old into a quarter million dollars of debt yep. at 22. Exactly. Man, they have no idea what that means, how to handle that, what to do with that. Not mm-hmm. not to mention the lo- the opportunity cost of not working. Yep. You're incurring Those debt, four years? Yeah, instead of earning income. You could make years. 60, 70 grand a year. And then I heard a stat that says a lot, of, a lot of kids aren't even finishing at 22. A lot of kids are taking six years. So yep. that's like 24 to some, for some people. Yep. You 24, 25. An extra 30 grand a year. Yeah. For another year or two, mm-hmm. right? It's more than two hundred fifty grand. This is crazy, man. Um, well, co- college is has been the, the whole notion of of so many people going to college. That's a bubble. Yeah, and it's a bubble that started in around nineteen, the late forties, around nineteen. Right. Let me ask you this: because of the GI Bill, the GI Bill, What's the GI Bill? I think so. It was when servicemen came back from World War II, mm-hmm. and they were able to. I. I, I not a historian. I don't know if they got college for free or just highly reduced. Mm-hmm. I think it was free. Mm-hmm. And for, for forever before that, a very small percentage of the population went to went college. To college. Yeah. And over time, it became more and more normal to, for, you know, and the expectation was that everybody goes to college. Yeah. Mm. Now, right? Not now. back then. Yeah. Okay. Because me being like 23 and having a lot of friends that went to college. It's weird because my my whole life I've been told to go to college and I didn't. I went to college for a year and then dropped out. And I'm taking classes at Northwestern, Northwestern to try to get around the system. But I see all my friends in this debt and I'm here, I'm telling jokes, living happily free. I'm starting wow. to feel like I made the right decision wow. by just trying to be smart. I think the problem with college is with training kids to think that's the way out when it's nothing on the other side unless you make something on the other side. Correct. Yes. Correct. Especially if a person has some idea at 18 what they think they might want to do. You know, that makes the answer way more clear. Like if a person's like, no, I got to be a doctor. All right, cool. We got you. You need need to go to college. All right. What what do you say to the person? Because uh, as a kid, I was told by some of my counselors, go to college and figure it out, which now is kind of, looking back, that's a dumb thing to do. Mm. Go to college and figure it out. You should figure it out. But how? What do you recommend to a person who 
doesn't know. Like, mm. if you're 18 and, you, like, you can go to college, but you don't know what you should do. I think the truth is at 18, you've got enough of the world inside of you to have you, some idea. You think so? Some idea. Okay, what about and, and when, hold, hold, what I'm saying? And so what I'm saying is take that some idea okay. and be like, yo, let me shadow mm. some people. So I think I might want to do engineering mm. and law, mm. right? Those things seem kind of cool. Mm. Let me go talk to an engineer and a lawyer. That's my- See if I can connect on LinkedIn or Facebook, mm. find a lawyer, and be like, yo, hey, man, I'm, I'm 17, 18. I want to see what this is like. And then go figure out what what you might need to mm-hmm. do that. And okay. they might tell you you have to go to college to okay. be this kind of lawyer. Okay. And it's like yeah, you do. You you, you actually do. Okay. Um, so I would say shadow okay. is like the trick. Is like get, get around people and you know learn about that. That's, That's what I would say. Did you did you know you want to be a lawyer coming out of high school? Um. Yeah. Pretty you were much. in student government as a kid, right? Yeah. So you was always kind of like driven, like kind of had like like. Like I knew I wanted to be in business okay. or or a lawyer yeah. or or maybe both, mm-hmm. but I don't I don't agree with you. But the shadowing thing it's not it's not practical, um, because the idea of using LinkedIn to you know to to connect with people and then getting some lawyer who's busy just trying to keep you know her schedule on track day by you know every, everybody is is just so busy in the world. Um, it, it goes back to connections, um, and you know the rich will just get richer and the poor will just get poorer because, um, sure, if you're the son or the daughter of a lawyer who has a lot of lawyer friends and you want to be a lawyer, okay, then yeah. maybe you'll get some of the shadow. I, I kind of think that, um, and I, I also disagree that the average 18-year-old um, really has enough maturity or kind of, I don't know how you described it, the world a, inside a rough, them. They've seen 18 years of the world. They have a rough idea of what seems kind of cool to them or not. Uh, all right, I suppose that's fair. Um, but And, and the, from there, from that seed, try and, try and connect with someone who does that to learn. What about community college for the first, you know, a lot, a lot of a successful pathway for a lot of people is to go to community college for a year or two. Yep. And uh, if it turns out that college isn't for you, yes. you have not wasted a whole lot of money. Mm-hmm. And if you right. at least paid attention and you know you were diligent, you learned something while you were there. Right, you're dipping your toe in the water. Right, and and while you're doing that, you could you know do other things and try to make connections. Yeah, yeah, I but think that makes sense too. That's another that's another option. I think is good. Okay, my Amish kids are going to go to community college. <laughs> <laughs> so they'll, they'll be raised Amish. That's fun. How are they going to get there? Uh, horse and carriage, horse and carriage, no, or their sure. walk. I just want to make sure. <laughs> uh, so the stock market. Back to that, right? Okay. So yeah, investing in the stock market. I mean, on average, if you put in um, some money in the stock market, on average, over a long period of time, the money doubles every seven years. Okay, on doubles. A, you doubles. told me this. I know this. Right. Okay. Yeah. And in fourteen years, it it quadruples mm-hmm. approximately. All right. In twenty years. On average, the last hundred years, in twenty years, if you have the money in the market, it goes up eight times, eight x. Mm-hmm. So if you put in a hundred grand, it's eight hundred grand after twenty years. Mm-hmm. It's crazy. Why didn't so you I, tell me this when I was thirteen? <laughs> I was trying to tell you. You had shit in your ears. Clean your ears, Chris. Sorry. Anybody have a Q-tip? So why is the stock market up? So I think the Federal Reserve is the biggest reason. The Federal Reserve is the most important institution in this country. What they basically do is determine interest rates. They determine monetary, or something called monetary policy. And what they've been doing is basically creating easy monetary policy, making it much easier for people to borrow money. And that's been really a big help to the stock market. But also, there's a bunch of regulation that the government is passing legislation that's really helping industries and corporations. Um, today, today, Friday, we did get a report on GDP. That's also been a positive. It's basically showing that our economy grew at 3.2% January, February, March, the first quarter of 2019, which is actually higher than everyone expected. So um, even though the world is kind of slowing down economically, uh, the U.S. had a good quarter, and it's not clear what's going to happen going forward, but um, you know, that's a good sign at least for this quarter. You've got Uber, right? Have you guys heard about Uber going public soon? Do you see all that? I didn't know it was going public. Yeah, they're going to cool. they're going to try and raise money in the public stock markets. John, you knew about that, right? Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, but I don't pay a lot of attention because you know, the when you said the stock market is up, that was news to me. Mm. Because really? yeah, I I think I've in past episodes, I think you've advocated things like 
you know, just keep investing, investing, yeah. investing. Don't worry about trying to time the market, you know. Correct. So that's what I do long term. I'm just always trying to save and invest and, mm -hmm. you know, you dollar cost average. Yes. And, and you, you try not. I don't pay attention to the market day to day. Fantastic. Let me ask you this. Cause we talked about this last time. I think this is what I'm going to do. I, I'm, I, I'm, I've been saving and I've been investing, but it, it's kind of hard for me being a young guy not having a lot of money to do both. Because, you know, the mindset is I'm seeing two different things outside, uh, outside of, like, taxes coming out of my check. So I think instead of saving, I'm just going to double down on investing and make that my savings. Oh, yeah. What do you for think sure, about that? For sure. For sure. Absolutely. Okay. I mean, wait, wait, wait. What as, are you talking as, about? You're saving and investing. Oh, uh, so I mean, like, saving as in, like, a savings account. Oh, saving. Okay. That's what I meant. Just cash going into a yeah. savings account. Oh, okay. Account. And then investing as in, like, putting anything into the stock with, like, apps. So it's okay. Gonna, me saving and put something in the stocks because it's just too much money. It just like it looks weird. I'm like, oh, this money's just leaving my hand. I'd rather just do one or the other, either save my money or invest. I, I think as long as you have a longer term perspective, mm -hmm. you know, if you're putting money in for the stock market today, mm -hmm. and you're like, I'll take it out in a month or two or a year or two, mm -hmm. that it's a little dangerous because mm -hmm. stocks can go down, mm -hmm. right? They they do go down. Mm -hmm. um, if you're thinking longer term, mm -hmm. like yo, I'm thinking five plus years. You better, you know, the way our economy and our market and our, our country set up, it's likely to be significantly, substantially higher after those five years. Okay. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So that's, the, I just want to make sure you're aware, a longer term perspective is, is what you need there. Okay. So maybe some of the money you're like, yo, I'm going to need this next month or next mm -hmm. year, put that on the side as cash. Okay. But longer term, you know, you could put money in stash okay. or, or, or betterment. You know what mm -hmm. I'm saying? So, um, yeah, we had, the big thing this week was earnings. A lot of companies reported how much money they made in the first quarter, and um, and earnings are looking pretty good overall. A lot of these companies are making making good money. Um, well, just to finish up with Uber, though, um, you know these guys are going public. They're probably going to be the biggest IPO this year of all of the tech IPOs coming. Right? We're in a weird situation where technology companies it feels a little bit like two thousand. A lot of companies who don't make any money, in fact, they lose money, like Lyft, Slack, mm -hmm. Uber, DoorDash, some of these Postmates. No, Netflix. Netflix, right? Netflix. These guys, well, they, they didn't go public, but a lot of the okay. other ones, but but they do lose money. Mm -hmm. Netflix know? loses money? They do, absolutely. Yeah. I didn't know that. They're hoping to go uh, make a profit, I think, 2021. And yep. Slack loses money? Slack is at like, uh, I think 700. Wait, I saw the number today. I think it's wrong. I can't remember. They lose a substantial amount of money each year. Yeah, Uber loses significant amount of money. Do you know the business behind that? How does this work technically? You know, like if what do you, you mean? I mean, because like on the outside looking in, you tell me they're losing money, but how, they, but we know they're not really losing money. They probably doesn't like they're probably like getting loans and yes. holding down until they make the money. So I was asking. That's you, exactly okay. So they're borrowing a bunch. Okay. Uh, people are loaning them money, mm -hmm. but also they're going to try and raise money here in the stock market. Okay. Right and those both will fund mm -hmm. their operations. Mm -hmm. They'll be able to keep paying drivers and keep mm -hmm. doing it all. You know what I'm saying? Um, but yeah, everyone's like, yo, y'all ain't making money. Mm -hmm. So everyone who buys these IPOs, who buys these stocks that are losing money, is kind of like playing the lottery. Okay. Like they're hoping they get, they buy the stock that ends up being like the next Google. Mm -hmm. You know, they're trying to put a big chunk of money, like for some reason, PayPal has agreed to put in $500 million in Uber. They're going to buy $500 million of this IPO. And what they're doing there is basically betting, like, Uber's going to be the one. They're going to eventually make money in the next, you know, five, ten years. That's a great bet. And be a huge... You think so? I mean, I don't know. Like, like how many Googles were there 20 years ago? How many... Um, Apple was nothing 20 years ago. You know, I, I mean, I don't... I don't think Uber... I don't see Uber going anywhere. I mean, just, I, I don't agree. see Uber going anywhere. Just yeah. who's taking down Uber? Right. Everybody uses Uber. Taxis are it's becoming synonymous with our language. Like, oh, yeah. they're taking Uber. Like, it's hard to think that. My Uber mom doesn't even know how to use her phone, and she told me the other day I was using. I'm, I'm going to take an Uber. She oh, only, no shit. yeah, exactly. She's like, I don't know how to use the phone, but I think I'm just going to try to call Uber real quick. So <laughs> I like. So that's what I'm saying. I don't see. I mean, that would be. Did she try the calling bet. Uber on a telephone? That's so funny. I don't. She's. A, <laughs> I don't know. That's funny. <laughs> she might. <have. laughs> Hello. Hey, listen, with the uh, the PayPal thing, I, I haven't read about it. I don't know anything about it, but I'll tell you right off the, you know, my knee-jerk reactions. That sounds like a 
strategic investment. It doesn't sound like I they're agree. gambling on the that, stock. That's going what I was up. trying to say. Yeah. They want every Uber to accept um, PayPal, right? Accept PayPal, and, I guess so. and right now that's not even a thing because you just get in and out of the car without paying. Mm. Yeah, your credit card is linked directly to Uber. So I don't know why the PayPal is doing. It. I didn't understand. I, I would imagine though it has something to do with wanting to so. have you know their payment using Uber for uh, using PayPal for payments. I agree. Um, so yeah, so Uber's going public. Uh, they're starting their roadshow, and basically. I think these IPOs are uh, a barometer for how the stock market's doing. Can I ask you this real quick? Yeah. How do you know? Where do I find out this type of information? Like, how do you know Uber's going public? What do you What do you read to say? Business news. Okay. Like, I'll go to Yahoo Finance. Okay. It was a really great Street podcast. <laughs> 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 Business news and other shit. Um, yeah. So you know, it's, it's uh, Yahoo Finance is one of the one of the best ones online. Okay. Uh, to just get free business news they do a okay. good job um, but i also read the wall street journal some other things like that okay. uh, uh we talk about this after oh, it's, all good. it's all good it's a great question man mm -hmm. hey saint uh, how, how do you um saint saint how do you invest where do you invest your money i think i heard amr say you use apps, betterment uh no i use um uh let me look robin hood no stash stash and acorns yeah acorns stash and acorns do you know what acorns does no you link your debit card to acorns and every purchase you make, let's say you bought um, uh, a Starbucks coffee for two and a half dollars, they'll round it up to three and take that fifty cents and put it into the stock market. Mm -hmm. uh, but how do they? What do they invest in? They invest for you. They make the decisions, or is it mm -hmm. going into a, I don't know. an index fund? Probably some kind of index fund. I exactly, have, index I have fund, questions. multiple things. But it's not, it's really like a beginner site. They kind of yeah. make the mm -hmm. best ju judgment based off what they think. Yeah. All yeah. right. So the fact that Uber's going. Uh, public is merely interesting to you because you're you're not going to go invest in an IPO. You're investing um, through an app and sort of a well diversified mm -hmm. you know portfolio. Exactly. That some kind of mutual fund. And I'm also trying to take small steps without overwhelm overwhelming myself. So I'm trying to learn more about it so I can do something like that. Man, Saint James, but I love you, smart man. But I don't want to do too much at once because it's just overwhelming. I don't know a lot about it, so I'm like, okay. How do I do this? Where do I learn this? That's it. Where do I read this at? That's it. If that makes sense. Extremely okay. smart. Okay. I like that. St. James, you're my hero. That's funny. Thank All you. Right. <laughs> the last thing with these earnings, Tesla came out with their earnings this week. They actually lost more than expected. I think they lost $700 million in the last quarter. Um, everyone's worried like, oh, snap. People stop buying electric cars. You know, everyone's wondering like how many electric cars are they really going to sell? Are they going to sell enough to make a profit? Are they going to get back to profitability? Is Elon Musk on the way down? Blah, They're blah, blah. so easy to buy, though. You just go to the website and go, yeah, I want the black one with like the self-driving. It's like, cool, here's your monthly payment. Yeah, I think I saw a tweet like that Elon t t tweeted out the other day. It's like, you can go online and buy it with a car within like a minute. Two minutes. Yeah, crazy, right? So it's yeah. like, I'm not going to lie. I'm thinking about buying a Tesla. Like I trade my Jeep. Hell yeah. I trade would buy one if I could. Yeah. I want to. I'm thinking of trading my Jeep in or sell my Jeep and then put that money towards. What's the What's the benefit of a Tesla? Just because it's like electric car. Okay. Um. So you save on gas, um, and uh, you're helping the environment. So you okay. feel good. I think you feel a little better about yourself. Okay. It's very fast. It's fast. As Is it fast? Oh yeah. That's you should have started with that, Amit. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a beautiful car. And, and it has it has um uh autonomous driving. Mm -hmm. You can actually put on the uh autonomous driver like you're on a highway or something. Autopilot. Autopilot, and you, you just hands off. Okay. It's all good. It drives yeah. itself. Musk came out and said um, they're now putting chips inside each new Tesla that comes off the assembly line. And if you buy a Tesla, they're putting chips in there where they'll be able to um, download from you know the cloud into the new Tesla that you mm -hmm. buy software that can allow it to be a robo a robo taxi while you're not using the car. <laughs> no what are you way. laughing for, man? Stupid. Wait, no, I'm just laughing at. The fact that we live in, you know, yeah. we live in the, the future. Jetsons? Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> yeah. He did say, like, yo, we're not ready right this moment, but 2020 will be ready for, for we'll, we'll, we'll give you the download. They're now collecting thousands and thousands and millions of data points uh, with ev with all these chips. They got chips in every one of, every Tesla employee's car has a chip, that chip in it. They're collecting all that data, and they're using it to build out this software so that they can have um, autonomous driving, complete so autonomous driving. What is that... Uh, heavily affect uber because like that's when they turn a profit when they have a whole fleet of uh, self-driving cars there you go right so imagine that imagine how that impacts uber 
So that's why I think people who are betting on Uber, taking $500 million positions in Uber or whatnot, um, it's like, I really don't know what's going to happen with Uber. I think they're not going anywhere, but like, this is so early in the game. Wait, hold on, hold on, hold on. So if I'm understanding you correctly, you can drive your own Tesla, and then like, for example, at night, you can make money off your Tesla. Yes. As being an Uber driver for people. Correct. You have understood me correctly. <laughs> That's pretty dope. That is pretty amazing. But it sounds awful for the economy. Why? In what way? Because, you know, I, everybody I know that's not, look, everybody I know in the hood is an Uber driver. There's all right. the... All the jobs that are gonna disappear, that's awful. I don't Potentially, think that's right. Yeah, I don't think that's the best thing that can happen Man. for the economy. I think that's I don't awful. think it'll all take a, it won't happen overnight. Of course, but even then Still, that's the sounds over not a like five year period, yeah. I'm guessing by two thousand twenty three or twenty four, like we're gonna be seeing a lot more autonomous I don't cars. Think that's, I think that's bad. But maybe people want that experience of talking to an Uber driver. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's funny. Well we, yeah, I mean if we can cut that out, that's fine. But although what you said before, so the idea is that I have enough money to buy a Tesla and then I'm gonna let my Tesla drive around without a driver, <laughs> picking people up That's to earn a little bit of extra money. And I'm not gonna mind having strangers get in and out of my Tesla. That's true. It's, it's, gonna, well, come, it's, gonna, come, it's gonna come back to my parking spot. I'm gonna get out in the morning, go jump in my car, and it's gonna be vomit all over the back seat by some blonde girl who just like, you know, was out late. That's racist. Don't ask me why she's ah. <laughs> That's totally racist. <laughs> she wasn't racist. Jewish though. She wasn't it's just Jewish. Just stereotypical. <laughs> Said she was blonde. I knew that. I know. Oh, now Jewish people can be blonde. So yeah. can Muslim people. You mean with like help of uh, hair coloring? Yeah, hair color. <laughs> I mean, it's pretty rare. Converts. Now we're going in a whole different. Direction. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go there, baby. Uh, so anyway, they report earnings. Uh, their stock is down fifteen percent. Um, Tesla, because oh, no. because they just lost so much money. And Musk was trying to boost up the stock, I think, with announcing all these, uh, like the robo taxi feature. So, point point being, um, um, earnings overall are doing better than expected. Uh, the market's doing well. Continue to invest is my suggestion. Um, I believe the market needs a breather here, so it might actually not be a bad place to um, to to put a little extra money if you wanted. Um, I personally wouldn't. I'd be keep keeping powder dry. We're so late in the economic cycle. I would think, you know. What does that mean? Is it like a time clock for this like i mean not no technically no there's no time clock but when you're when when the stock market was been going up for 10 years straight okay it's down the cr- down it's like, crash yeah i okay. mean it may be not crash but definitely bound to go down okay um, and yeah when you're growing for 10 years in our economy bubbles are probably forming in places that we're not aware of mm-hmm. so what does that mean in this context bubbles? the bubbles yeah uh for example right now we're at i think 260 trillion dollars in debt globally mm-hmm. there's just so much money being borrowed all over the globe it's a record. To me, that's like, yo, there's so much borrowing that's happened out there. There's bound to be some place, some industry somewhere where they borrowed too much and they boosted up that part of the economy too much. And if those loans don't get paid back, you could have a major, you know, uh, minor or major problem on your hands where all these companies aren't paying shit back. Okay. So um, that's one example of what the bubble could be. I, I, I don't see where the bubble is right now. That's one, that's one possibility. But yeah, so I mean, when you're growing for that long, it's inevitable, especially in the way our economy set up, that bubbles will form, mm-hmm. and then, you know, the market will take a hit. That's the stock market. Let's jump into talking about. Ooh, can I ask a question real quick? Go for it, brother. Is there like uh, advanced sixty twenty twenty for moments that we're in like right now? Ooh, um, I mean, the first thought is sixty twenty. What did that question mean? Advanced sixty oh, twenty. So a big thing I talk about on this podcast is sixty twenty twenty. Instead of telling people, oh, go make a budget and do your Excel spreadsheet, and do, 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 that's complicated for too many people, for most people. I say, yo, keep it simple. Do a 60-20-20 formula. 60% of your money, put it in one, divert it to one checking account for safety. S, food, rent, whatever you need to pay your bills, utilities, cell phone. 20% goes to another S, savings account. That goes to your stash, Robin Hood, go to the stock market. And then the last 20%, goes to splurge, the other S. Whatever you want to splurge on, whatever your thing is, vacations, um, you know, uh, partying, wh- wh- whatever you want to spend your money on, um, fashion, extra extra cra- you know, crazy fashion, wh- whatever your thing is, you know, um, jewelry. So I say do 60, 20, 20. And I say even at market times when we're this high in the market, keep going with that 20% even though it may not make sense because of what you said, dollar cost averaging. 
if you have the courage to keep going with that 20 percent market eventually is going to go down you keep investing in that in that lower prices you're going to benefit oh and, and by the way going back to something that you said a little bit ago um i think saint asked question would it be better i love you bro <laughs> say not ask to, the question not, you know is it would it be better maybe not to go to college and just take that money and put it in the market and you're like yeah you know you put a hundred thousand dollars in today and in eight years you should double. have uh double but and i know you know this but just to clarify yes. the last thing you would do is take a hundred thousand yeah. dollars and put it in the Thank market you. at once Thank you. You would dollar Espe cost to average it in. Especially right now. Yeah, especially right now. I yeah. would take that hundred and over a period of like, I don't know, maybe even like two, three years. Okay. And every week just put in one thousand of that hundred. One thousand. Is there 1, a 000. difference? Is there a difference? Yeah. Uh is yeah. it just a smart oh. because because if you put it in right now, for example, the S P five hundred is at two thousand nine hundred and thirty right now. Mm -hmm. You're gonna be putting it in at that price. Mm -hmm. Uh at two thousand nine hundred and thirty. Mm -hmm. But uh, if you w if you put in a thousand each week, maybe in six weeks it'll be at two thousand, mm -hmm. and you're like, damn, I'm glad I waited. I'm getting in at a lower price. Mm -hmm. So that's called dollar cost averaging. Mm -hmm. You're basically not putting all your eggs in one basket today, mm -hmm. and hoping it goes up from today. Um, you're over time doing it. Mm -hmm. Another way to say it is is um, at, at some point the market will go down ten percent, twenty percent in a day. And what if you choose the day before that day uh, to put your hundred thousand right. dollars in? That's good. I that like is. that. It's a great way to describe it. Um, and on that note, our main man, JF John Freeland, bankruptcy attorney. Woo! Thank you for joining us, John. It's so good to have you here, man. You're very smart. Thank God you're not the Netflix John Freeland. Thank God. You know, I used to see his name and you know, like I thought he was it was cool because he was famous and stuff and before the N word stuff? Yeah, but then I saw that, I was like <laughs> <laughs> John guys, John Friedland, right? This guy has in some ways written the book on bankruptcy. He's written a, a book called Commercial Bankruptcy Litigation. He's the primary author on that book. He's the primary all right, thank you. Saint giving you some props. He's the primary author on a book called Strategic Alternatives for and Against Distressed Businesses. He also wrote a book called The Investor's Guide to Alternative Assets, like private equity assets or, private or venture capital investing, angel investing. He wrote The Investor's Guide. Uh, he's a partner at a place called Sugar Felsenthal. Yeah. All right. Uh, so he ain't messing around as a partner. But you started at Kirkland & Ellis, if I'm not mistaken, right? I didn't start there, oh. but I was at Kirkland for a while as a partner at that firm. Yeah. You were a partner at Kirkland as well, which is a big firm here in Chicago. Um, so, yeah, we, we ain't messing with a, uh, a rookie here. We don't, have a, uh, we don't have a guy in the double A's or triple A's. We have a dude in the major leagues. Keep talking. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> don't stop. <laughs> Enterprising smart man. I like you, John. All right, so before we ask you how to make money, explain to us the bankruptcy process in a simple, simple way. If a, if in your answer, please answer this. When a company, when is it wise for a company to declare bankruptcy? To call you up and say, "Hey, we want to we want to declare bankruptcy. Can you help us?" Like. Like give us the simple, simple version. When's it wise, and then what would that look like? Um, Can you explain using apples and oranges? <laughs> Please. Maybe a string. So um, for, first of all, uh, you know, bankruptcy is a tool for a struggling, distressed company. And it's just one, one tool. There's, there's a number of tools. And a lot of times uh, clients will call or potential clients will call assuming they want to they, they need to file bankruptcy and that's usually not the case uh, that's usually not the tool that's right for that client mm -hmm. but sometimes it is um, bankruptcy and, and another You're saying most, most so it's, it's it's not wise for most companies who think they need to go bankruptcy it's not wise for them to do it usually yeah I mean that's what my experience bears out because there's these other tools mm -hmm. bankruptcy is kind of and let me back up a step um, if you see uh, a billboard for a bankruptcy lawyer, just like you see billboards for you know DUI lawyers and criminal lawyers, that's not what I do. Um, you wouldn't come to me if you're a human being 
who has you know debt and wants to get rid of the debt um, any more than uh, you know if if you have a heart issue you wouldn't go to a dermatologist um, you know, a heart doctor yeah law is uh, very specialized and it's so specialized that somebody who's very qualified to do um, business bankruptcy is pretty much completely unqualified to do consumer or personal bankruptcy. I was, I was, that's funny, Kyle. I was about to ask you personal questions. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can ask, but I probably couldn't answer. Right. Um, so, and 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 so, Chapter Eleven bankruptcy, which is for you know businesses. Um, chapter Eleven is is the law. Um, so the bankruptcy code is. Um, there's, uh, you know, law. Uh, I don't, I don't want to get too, you know, too okay. dumbed down. But when we talk about the law, what is the law? The law is statutes written by the legislature, and the law is cases that have been decided by judges. And so, when you want to go to court and you want to make an argument, you might be making an argument based on a statute. Or on a case. Previous case that a judge right. opined right. on. Right, and that's how law works in the United States. Mm. So the bankruptcy code is actually um, sort of like a nickname for the section of the United States code that governs bankruptcy. Mm. So there is a, you know, the U United States code is this big uh, set of uh, laws that govern all kinds of things, and part of it is what governs bankruptcy. Mm. So bankruptcy is a national thing. Um, you don't go to state court when you want to file bankruptcy. You go to federal court, federal bankruptcy court. And um, so chapter 11, the, the bankruptcy code is divided into chapters. And if you're a human being, pretty much you're going to file a chapter 7 or a chapter 13. Uh, sometimes you could file an 11. If you're a company... And that clears you of your debts if you were to successfully file. With a lot of caveats, yeah. Okay. I mean, there are some debts you can't get clear of. Uh, and there's Student some, debt. Right. And there are some bad acts you could conduct that would make you not eligible to get rid of your debt. What's uh, uh, you got an example of bad acts? You, you, you're just uh, trying to check check your list, see if you did any of those? <laughs> no, nah, no. Nah, it just caught my ear. What is bad? Like, uh, so, like loans? Like No, no, no. So um, there, there are certain debts. There's, like so two, two buckets. Okay. One bucket is there are certain debts – where, so Congress passed, the, you know, is, is responsible for creating the bankruptcy code. Mm -hmm. And Congress has said, you know what, um, in this country, honest people who just by bad luck or bad fortune fall, you know, get, are down in their luck, they should be able to get a fresh start. So mm -hmm. we're going to have this thing called bankruptcy because that's an important policy. We want people to be able to do that. So... The exceptions are bucket number one is just like Congress decided that a fresh start is important, mm -hmm. they've actually decided that there are some things that are more important. So um, if you're supposed to pay child support, you can't get rid of that debt in bankruptcy okay. because Congress decided that that debt, that, that's a more important policy than letting you get free of your debt. Mm -hmm. Um, I think if you injure somebody while driving drunk, you can't get rid of that debt. Mm -hmm. So there's a whole list of – remember, I'm that not a personal sense. bankruptcy mm -hmm. lawyer, so I don't exactly – my examples might be, you know, with they come with caveats. Sure, okay. Um, and then uh, – so you could file bankruptcy and get rid of all your debts but those debts, mm -hmm. the certain specific debts that are listed, types of debts. The other bucket is – Remember, the point about bankruptcy is if you're a good, honest person, you well, what if you're not honest? So if you uh, committed certain um, bad acts either, I think either before the bankruptcy or during the bankruptcy, you can be denied a – when you file – uh, when you're a human being, you file bankruptcy, you're, you're, you're trying to get a discharge. That's the magic word, discharge. And um, – you may be denied a discharge um, blanket, no discharge, if you lie in the papers you submit when mm. you file bankruptcy, for example. Mm -hmm. Or, well, that's a good example. Sure. Okay. All right, so, so the big thing I heard was sometimes it's – most times it's not wise for a company who calls you up saying, hey, we should go bankruptcy. It, most times it's not – that's not the case. You actually will carry them through – 
other alternatives, yeah. not bankruptcy. All right, but so let's say it's a company. Give us an example of a company where you did say you do need to go through bankruptcy. I will shepherd you. I will walk you through that as, as your attorney. Um, maybe something we've heard of. Um, well, it's getting a little dated, but a, a, a company I took through bankruptcy was, remember the in malls they used to have uh, s- stores called, there were music stores, record stores originally, Music Land or Sam Goody. Yeah, I remember those. Okay. Super um, overpriced CDs. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I wonder why they went bankrupt. <laughs> <laughs> so they had like a thousand stores in like every mall in the country. Damn, a thousand stores. And right. uh, they were under different biz- uh, under d- different DBAs. Um, so one company, but some of them were called Sam Goody, some of them were called Music Land, some of them were called other things. And um, that company was a, a very appropriate to file a bankruptcy for that company because there are certain tools. That, that, so, so I called bankruptcy a tool. So um, there are certain specific tools in that tool that are available only in bankruptcy that you don't have elsewhere. Uh-huh. And, and the downside of filing, you know, speaking very broadly, I always analogize a, a corporate bankruptcy to chemotherapy. Damn because it's very powerful medicine. It can help your company, but just like chemotherapy will kill not just the bad cells, but it'll kill the good cells, and that's why you get sick. So uh, filing a bankruptcy can be very helpful, but it definitely has its costs, and and it creates some trouble that um, if you can avoid that, if you can get to the result you want to get without having to use that powerful medicine, you should. Okay. All right, so in this Musicland Sam Goody case, they called you up, you looked at their books, you looked at their situation, you're like, yup, you need to go through bankruptcy chapter 11, I presume, right? Um, I mean, that's a that's an oversimplification of how, you know, we the got the case, went right. how, yeah, <laughs> and all that, but, yeah, I mean, punch we, line. the, the, the punch company line. came to us and, um, you know, sought counsel as to um, what, what to do, and we analyzed the situation, and we... Um, we decided ultimately um, to to you know file a bankruptcy. All right, and that, and, and that in a one or two minute version, what happens there? All their debts, all the millions that they owed bankers and lenders, that got wiped out. No, no. Um, so when you file, when a company files a bankruptcy, it just does. It doesn't. Well, you you. It's possible to file a bankruptcy without the end goal in mind, but that's not the way to do it that's oh, not you, best practice you want to know what you're going to look like at the end of it all before you begin filing yeah you you want to decide okay my end our end goal is x what's the best way to achieve x and in that case and that's why you see a lot of retailers music land was a retailer and that's why you see uh, well there's two reasons why you see a lot of retailers file bankruptcy uh, one reason is it's the same reason why there's this popular misconception that the weatherman is usually wrong, whereas statistically the weatherman is usually right, right. 98% is that right? of the time. Uh-huh. It's just that you kind of remember when he was wrong. Nah, so um, most companies that file bankruptcy uh, are not retailers, but it sure seems that way to uh-huh. the general public because those are the ones you hear about. Right. Uh-huh. Right, you Sears, see, the, you see Kmart, the street walkers right. with their signs. They're going out of business sales right. signs, and right. and you know they're talked about in the newspaper because um, you might have a company the size of Sears file bankruptcy, and you might have another Pay company, shoes. sure, and you might have another company the so, that that's twice as big as Payless Shoes or Sears, but it's some manufacturing company or it's some B two B company, right. and the people who read the newspaper they never heard of them. So then that's one of the reasons why the newspapers don't bother publishing stories about them. Interesting. Whereas, the, so the retailers get a little more attention. Okay, so so in this case, Sam Goody and Musicland, uh, you guys knew what the exit was going to be before you even began. Yeah, yeah. Well, in that case, the goal was real simple. It was very clear, and it was a number of years ago. So I'm going from memory, but it was very clear going in that the um, senior secured lender was underwater. And what I mean is that the value of the company was using pretend numbers. The, the value of the company 
was a hundred dollars and the senior secured debt was five hundred dollars so it was very obvious okay. that um they had way more debt way more they they owed so much more money than what the company was worth right and just to and I, i'm saying senior secured lender and what i mean is that if you're a company of any size you have a you probably have a loan with a bank or with some other institutional lender, um, you have a revolving line of credit. And when you get a revolving line of credit, it's customary to pledge all of your assets to that lender. Damn. Um, so just like a human being might, um, you know, if you have a Visa card and you file bankruptcy, Visa card is Visa's unsecured, so you can wipe out your Visa debt. Right. But on the other hand, if you have a car and you bought it with a loan, um, you borrowed, you know, money from the the car, you know, finance company. Uh, that's a sec- usual. That's going to be a secured debt because the, when you signed your paperwork, you gave the car company uh, or the or the financing company a security interest, a mm. lien on your car. On the car. So right. if if you file bankruptcy or if you don't pay your debts, forget the filing bankruptcy. If you don't pay your debt to the to the car financer, it has the legal right to come and take your car, right? Repossess your car. Repo man. Repo man. But Visa doesn't have the legal right, um, and I think in some some exceptions they actually have different kinds of credit cards that are secured credit cards. Sure. In this case, yeah, Visa. But, no. but generally, Visa, Visa don't have a repo man. It doesn't have a repo man. It doesn't have the legal right to repo. Would like to take your car back, sir? Uh. <laughs> so they can't come into your house and take your Sony TV back. That put you I've seen that on, on TV though. What have, have you seen, have on, you TV? seen on TV like where suddenly like a house is just empty? They took the car, they took the TV, they took the desk, they took the furniture, and you just walk into an empty house because you didn't pay your desk. You ever see that on TV? Um, no, but I can picture what you're saying, and that's probably going on. That that's the example of the exception. Uh, what's that? The exception. It's the exception, right? Because um, right. that's probably. Uh, that family that lost all that stuff, um, they probably filed bankruptcy before, and then the only kind of credit card they could get was a secured credit card. Uh, I got you. Um, but that's, that's why they lost other shit. Gotcha. Yeah, I um, think it was like Three's Company or somewhere. I saw that on. <laughs> Remember that? Uh, Jack Tripper. All right, so so all right, so Music Land. So they, they had way too much debt. The yeah. Co- the value of the company was close to zero. Uh, or much lower than debt. I mean, so the value what, of the company was substantial, as many millions of dollars, because you know my hundred dollars is just a hypothetical number. Right. But the point is, it was a hun- worth a hundred million dollars. The secured debt was two hundred million dollars. Right, right. And that's, um, that's so. What a, do you, so? What did you do in that situation? Well, that's an easy fact pattern because, um, so so what would be more difficult? I'll tell you what we did in a minute. But what would be more difficult is, what if so you have to understand the difference between secured debt and unsecured debt. Secured creditors are entitled to p- be paid 100 pennies on the dollar before unsecured creditors can get anything. Right. So, and, and value is a funny thing. Um, you know, until you test value in the market, and if you're just going by what experts say, it's, it's, a, it, it's pe- something people can argue about. So what I'm saying is, going into the case, there was a view that, the company was worth X, and if, um, so let's say the company was, you know, we thought the company is worth $100, um, and the secured debt is $500, that's one thing. But what if we thought this the, the value of the company was $100, and the amount of the secured debt was $101? So it's pretty close. It's pretty close, and at which point, if it's close, then you have to kind of ask yourself um, if the value turns out, what if the, if, what if the company really is worth $110? Now, if the company's really worth $110 and the bank's owed $101, that's nine extra dollars for who? For the unsecured creditors. Right. And not to turn this, definitely not to turn this into a legal lecture. Too late. But... <laughs> um, so the people running the company, there's a board of directors, right. and the board of directors usually has a duty to the shareholders of the company. Yes. A fiduciary duty. Um, but when a company's insolvent, the, um, the practical effect, um, you know, in, and it, I emphasize the practical effect because I'm speaking in shorthand, 
um, is that now it's the creditors who are owed the duty because they effectively own the company. There's right. no, their val- equity is, is worthless. Right, right. Equity right. will not get a recovery. The people who are owed money on a debt basis, they basically have taken, um, you know, priority over the people who have equity. Um, shareholders. Yeah, I mean, they, they always had priority, and as long as right. the company right. was worth a lot, you know, more than the debt, then it's a solvent company, and, right. and the board of directors can run the company for the benefit of the shareholders. Oh, but once once this the once it's, it's once the solvent. creditors are worth more and it's insolvent, the board of directors kind of has no no play here. It just automatically falls into the formula. Uh, the board of directors stays in control and still has uh, absolute. It has control, but. Now, instead of looking out for the interests of the shareholders, they also have to look out for the interest of the creditors. Gotcha. All so, right, so, so, so let's anyway. pause. So, so Music Land, Sam Goody. So you guys, what did you guys end up ultimately doing? Selling it. So you guys we, found a buyer? Yeah. Um, and they took on all that debt? No, no, no. So the common play in bankruptcy when it's clear that – and, and it, when, it's, when it's clear to all of the interested parties that – the company is worth less than the amount of um, debt. Right. A common scenario is the company, the company's assets are sold in the bankruptcy, um, and uh, you wouldn't catch this if you weren't a lawyer. But <laughs> I said the company's assets, not the company. Okay. So there's a difference between buying the equity of a company right. and buying the assets of the company. Yeah, I guess the buyer. Who was the buyer? Um, as a matter of fact, it was a competitor. Okay. It was uh, a company called... Um, Coconuts? <laughs> Trans... Yes. Was it? Yeah, that would make it wasn't, sense. That, was wasn't the, that a video store or They were the other big one. It was Coke. Yeah. There was a, the owner of that store. I think was called Trans World Entertainment. Okay. And I think Trans World Entertainment, among other things, owned, owned Coconuts. So they bought the assets of Musicland Sam Goody, which gave them what? All thousand stores? No, um, they bought the assets. Um, not all the assets, but a lot of the assets. And one of the um, remember, I described you know bankruptcy as having a lot of powerful tools that other other uh, cures don't. Yeah. So one of the tools is that um, it allows the company, which is called the debtor, to assume or reject leases. Is this Coconuts or Transworld? Th- th- no, this this is this was mm. home, um, music music land. music land. So music land is allowed to let's say it's got a thousand locations, and let's say um, two hundred the locations are really profitable. But 800 locations are bad. Um, the, oh, they can cherry pick. They, they can cherry pick. And they can, they can nice. basically reject the bad leases. So the buyer only, has to, only takes the leases it Makes wants. Makes sense. All right, so Coconuts gets all the, only the good stores. That's right. That's what happened in that situation. Yeah. And then, and then a lot of the debt also got wiped out. Well, when you buy assets, you don't— You're just buying assets. You're just buying you're assets. Not buying, yeah, you're not buying all the loans. Right. I so, got you. And, and the, the, the key thing about bankruptcy and some cousins of bankruptcy, other legal regimes that, that, were not, that I haven't talked about and probably won't on this podcast, is, um, is that when you have these sales, the buyer is protected from so, – so if you had a company and it was doing badly and I wanted to buy it, I, I thought it would be a good business to like merge into my business. Um, you know, I could pay you whatever I pay you, a- and then um, I could take the assets, and t- the contract would say that I'm not taking the liabilities. I'm just taking the assets. Yep, I don't want none of this shit. But if I paid you not enough mo- the money I paid you was not enough to pay all your debt, all of your company's debt. Mm-hmm. The creditors of your company conceivably could come after me. Oh, they could potentially. Sure. Outside of bankruptcy. Outside of bankruptcy. Inside of bankruptcy, they can't. Protected, right. Unprotected. Makes sense. Because bankruptcy, part of the process is that it's an open auction and there's procedures to make sure that the the assets were marketed properly. All right. Well, this this deal Coconut's got sounds great, as, as I understood it. Help us make cheddar. Help us understand how to make money. What I love about John's website, when I looked him up, 
He literally has this on his website. Quote, I quote, John views his job very simply. To make clients money whenever possible. Mm-hmm. I've never heard a more gangster line in my life. I, I agree, actually. Yeah, <laughs> We need to hire this guy. All right, but what and to protect, protect clients' interests at every turn. Yes. You have to I think is it. the way it um, yeah. concludes. It was just way less sexier than the first part. I'm sorry. All right, so uh, so, reasonable minds. <laughs> so, uh, so are there entrepreneurs out there successfully making money off of bankruptcy? Like, like is there people out there Donald who are like, Trump? well, are there people out there who have like fifty grand, a hundred grand, oh, maybe a million no dollars, and they're like, yo, I want to buy a company worth a million dollars for a hundred grand, ten cents on the dollar, or I want to buy a ten million dollar company for a million dollars. Are there people out there who are scooping up these kinds of deals? Buy property. Like yeah, like like real estate potentially. Yeah. But let's first talk about companies before we get to real estate. In the world of bankruptcy, in that world, um, do you have you been part of those types of transactions with entrepreneurs? Um, yeah, I, I deal with that all the time. You do? Yeah, I mean almost so on a like, daily basis. So you know how like we sometimes will see a going out of business sign in a store. You walk in, everything's like ninety percent off. Mm-hmm. It sounds like John, you are the place to go. Like you're the going out of business store for businesses. That are going out of business. No, I don't know about I, I don't know about that. Um, <laughs> we go to you if if we go to you to buy a business that's going out of business, right? Sure. Yeah. That's yeah. what I'm saying. All right. So, so yeah, give us give us an example, like one of your most successful examples of where uh, you've helped an entrepreneur scoop up a business on the cheap. Um. Okay. So sometimes it's not. Businesses, you know, you can buy an entire business as a going concern, or you can buy assets. Assets, okay. So um, I have a client that um, a number of years ago, probably about ten years ago. Remember, there was a. Uh, can you? Here's a trivia question. Ten years ago, what was Best Buy's most prominent competitor? Circuit City. Right. You remember oh, that, Chris? Yes. Yeah. Oh yeah. Good. Yeah. So um, there was a bankruptcy you case. For that one. <laughs> yeah, I, I remember that bankruptcy. I remember trying to go in there and buy like a free, a cheap VCR or something like that. Mm. Ten years ago, they were all gone. So there was, um, you know, there's a bankruptcy, and the, the um, and I didn't represent the company. I didn't represent the debtor. I didn't represent the the senior creditor. I didn't represent any of the major parties. They had their going out of business sales at the retail level, where they sold the inventory in the stores to to consumers. Um, and then there was an effort to try to sell, um, you know, the business as a going concern because there's an idea, like there's usually an idea that the brand name Circuit City has value. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think so, probably somebody bought the, the name, but for probably very little money. So there was no sale as a going concern. So once the stores were almost all empty, there what was left? What other assets? Shelves? It, well, that, those are also sold. By the way, oh. the, these there's a whole cottage industry of liquidation firms that oh, specialize okay. in having these going out of business sales. Oh, got you. And they sell the inventory and then they sell the fixtures. All right. The shelves. Um, so what else is left, man? It's just a plain the plain box. The lease. So there's leases and it's possible to like Circus City signed leases with all these landlords. Right, and so there's something. Um, it's called designation rights. Uh, the the idea is that even though Circuit City isn't gonna use these leases, it has the right to um, assign the prop, you know, it can assign good ah. leases to other retailers Circuit or to City whoever. Circuit City could say, hey, this guy Amr Abdullah is gonna take our place and he's now gonna be the tenant. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that's one type of asset. Another type of asset, um, now you're not gonna usually have this in a retail case, is accounts receivable. Oh, right, okay. so a, a company may have a lot, a large, you know, if particularly if it's B two B, so um, you know, if it wasn't Circuit City that was in bankruptcy, yeah, but like it Caterpillar, was, all these tractors are selling to China, for example. Sure, and so all these commercial accounts receivable are valuable. Right, Caterpillar could be like, "Yo, we're out of business, but China still owes us a, a million dollars." Right, someone can buy that and try and get that million from China. Sure. So accounts receivable are another kind of asset, and you know there's intangibles like the like the, you know the brand name, brand the name, website, right. you know all that stuff, trademarks, and then um, there's a, a bunch of miscellaneous stuff. So in this 
getting back to sort of, you asked me a, a question about a right. successful deal. Right. So in Circuit City, um, if you don't know anything about retail, you can nonetheless imagine um, you wouldn't be surprised by the fact that so if there's there I don't know how many stores there were let's say there's two three hundred stores and making up the number all across the country so in order to support those stores there were regional distribution centers uh, right so you go to your local Circuit City and they're like oh I'm sorry we're out of this but we can get it from our distribution our distribution center, center and ha instead of having to go to like one central place wherever it was they've got twelve of them so they can get the stuff to them uh, sooner uh, right. So there were these 12 regional distribution centers that were jam-packed full of not anything new because all the new stuff had been sent to the stores and sold to the, you know, and the going out of business sales. It was jam-packed with defective and returned Returns. goods. Open item, baby. Mm. Return goods, open items. And so um, we- Some dude bought all that? Yeah, my client um, uh, bought all of that. Damn. And, um, He's not like the guy you can buy a TV off the back of a semi truck. Uh, well, <laughs> he doesn't sell them <laughs> off, of, off of the back of trucks. Reminds me of like the Dave Chappelle sketch. You ever see that one? <laughs> um, so he he has a refurbishing business. Um, ah. uh, it, there's an industry called reverse logistics, um, and there's a sub industry for consumer electronics. So he's got a big facility, and he's got um, uh, technicians. And one of the things he does is he has contracts with certain manufacturers mm. where whenever um, a customer wants to return something or get, have it fixed under warranty, instead of sending it back to the manufacturer, it, it gets shipped, to this uh, guy. shipped right to him. Right. And he will... Um, fix it and send it back. Fix it and send it back, right. or he will buy it. There's a prearranged, you know... Oh. Um, any, anyway, so... Um, Are you able to share what this guy paid back then for all that stuff? Um, it was in the neighborhood of $10 million. $10 million bucks. Yeah. How much was it worth, though? Um, I, I don't know you exactly uh, you know, what it all sold for, but I think you know, he, in the neighborhood of quadrupling, Damn. triple of quadrupling. Oh, $30 or $40 million. Dollars. I think so. That's a yeah. great okay. transaction. Yeah, I think so. And um, and it was it was interesting because the legal work wasn't that complicated, to, you know, to be very yeah, plain about just it. Just ten million bucks. Uh, most of what lawyers do um, is not that complicated. Well, what the hell are you guys doing all day then? <laughs> <laughs> Asking the real question. Drinking huh? martinis. So, <laughs> um, but what was interesting was the logistics involved because be, because of the need, the, the the greater needs of the bankruptcy. Remember, the, so there were these twelve facilities. They released, and they wanted to get the, out of the facilities as quickly as possible. Why? Because they didn't want to be in for another month of rent. Right. So my guy was obligated to, and I say my guy, it's a company. Sure. But I think of my clients as my guys. That's right, my boy. Um, and so the client was obligated to, to get everything out of these 12 facilities within like a week. Mm. And he had never done anything like this before. So he figured out how to you know, contract with commercial yeah, trucking firms the shit across out. the country. Took 180 trucks. No way. Semi, semi yeah. trucks. Get taking all, all that out. stuff what out cool and into his facility. All right. What about so? All right. So now, Saint James is a dude who's got a hundred grand burning a hole in his pocket. He's oh, trying to find a business, right? Maybe a million dollar business, a two million dollar business, five million dollar business where he Say can say louder on me. <laughs> where he can, uh, where he can. Take that hundred grand and possibly get a bankruptcy company on the cheap or something like that. Is there a place he can go? Like one of my favorite websites in the world. Uh, this reveals how cheap I am. It's called SlickDeals.net. Ah. And if any of y'all been on that site, it's not yeah. even a dot okay. com. I know uh, that's how cheap no. this site is. Um, sounds, I love man. They have too cheap. <laughs> they have all the best best deals on the web. Like, is there a SlickDeals.net for businesses? Um, yeah. Are you throwing me a softball question on purpose? No. Oh. Daily Dak? Well, that would be the closest thing That's that That's all exists. we know how to play here. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I wouldn't... And you, wait, so yeah, John, I know you own a website called Daily Dak, right? Yeah, so Daily Dak is... The Dak is D-A-C, Distressed Asset Central. Okay. And just like, you know, if you're a doctor and, you know, you use a lot of... You prescribe a lot of different medicines... 
maybe, and then you want to start investing in the stock market. And, you know, once you feel comfortable that you got a good portfolio that's diversified and responsible, it's, it's slightly more likely if you're going to kind of focus on a particular kind of stock, maybe you're going to kind of focus on drug stocks because it's something you know, you know about, right. right? So as a restructuring lawyer, bankruptcy lawyer, insolvency lawyer, like 10 years ago, I saw a need in the market for a website nice. just like the one you described. Yeah. And that's what his daily DAC is. Now, what I would say is if you're talking about um, you should uh, rename it like slicklawyers.net or something like that. <laughs> so <laughs> Definitely done it. Done. <laughs> so, you know, if you're um, knowing what little I, c I know about um, Saint, because you were asking Saint the question, or yeah. Saint was asking you the question, I don't remember. I asked him. Um, I asked you about Saint. Right. Mm -hmm. So He got 100 grand burn a hole in his pocket. The last thing he should be doing is trying to buy a troubled business. Okay. Um, out of bankruptcy or out of some other process. Ah. Because that's, I mean, you don't buy, there's no such thing as, oh, I'm going to go buy this business that's really worth 10 times what I'm going to pay for it. People aren't stupid. Uh, you know, the business people, that, the, the lenders that loan to it, um, even if the business owner is stupid, but usually they're not, um, you're not going to pick up a bargain like that. You're going to, I mean, yeah, going back to the other example, my guy paid, um, you know, about $10 million and he was able to sell it for a lot more, but he there had, was he had a the, lot of work. And he had, the, he had the, built a, the built up infrastructure to handle. He had the built up infrastructure. There was a lot of work right, and so there saying, was some risk. You're saying if he was, if St. James was in the business of refurbished TVs and VCRs, then that would have been a good use of his hundred grand or his ten million or whatever. Quite possibly, and then there are people, companies, and firms that um, this is what they do. They look oh, they for, look for distressed or sure. There's a whole type of private equity fund ah. that focuses a whole subclass of private equity that focuses on broken businesses. Right. So, um, and. You know they don't have necessarily they're not they don't have a business in the same business as what they're going to buy but they've got other stuff like years and years of experience of buying and turning around companies that's what I have, that's how i met john i have experience in the restaurant business because i grew up in the restaurant business and uh uh that's when i met john there was a coffee chain that was struggling and the hope was we can get that coffee chain through bankruptcy on the cheap and Use whatever I've learned in the restaurant business to kind of make those coffee restaurant coffee coffee shops better. So that that's kind of what you're saying is previous knowledge that I had would make the bankruptcy transaction make sense. Yeah, yeah. All right. So what you're basically saying for an average dude to drop a hundred grand on a business is tricky. Well, there, yeah. There aren't many entrepreneurs who do that. Right. I mean, well, f f take a step back. Um, so, uh, Saint. Is a comedian, right? He right. spends his time honing his craft, and, and he doesn't. He's not particularly experienced in running a business. He's yeah. So in that and case, he'd be looking for like jokes that have gone bankrupt. He can buy up those jokes right. and use them in stage, right, right, right. So you know, and and by the way, if we're gonna look at how you invest, how one invests their money on a spectrum, so as we as you've said on past shows, and as uh, most many. Uh, smart advisors will 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 advise. You don't just pick one stock. Again, you 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 pick a market index or right. at least a mutual fund, right? A bucket, right? You should only be investing in individual stocks. If, um, if there's two reasons you should be investing in uh, uh, individual stocks, if you have a if you already have a good portfolio and you can afford to lose the money. Yep. Um, I mean that's that you sh that's like the the baseline. Yep. Right, so I got a question. So what if then? You have the money, and let's say you have no knowledge, but you hire someone who does have the knowledge to turn that business around. So you're just putting the money in so that you make the money. Um, yeah, that that's totally – that's a thing. Is that a thing that is done quite often or no? Um, y yes. In Have you guys ever had occasion to talk about, a, a, about what a private equity fund is on this show? Not too much, no. I have no idea what that is. So – the idea that um, any of us around the table would just take money and, you know, let's say we were very well healed. Let's say um, that Saint 
it has five million dollars in investments and in the bank and he's very liquid and he saw an opportunity and he you know thought that maybe he'd like to buy this business but he's not going to run it so sure it's conceivable that um and usually it's the other way around the investor doesn't approach the operator the operator approaches the investor mm. so somebody who knows saint has a good deal of money um, and who has a pre-existing relationship with him probably and who is an operator who, who knows how to operate the business might you know that happens all the time hey saying I want to buy this will you be my partner I'll put in the sweat equity you put in the cash equity and boom but that's um, what, what's far more common and this is like this is like a whole different topic. You mentioned my book on alternative assets. So you wrote the investor's guide to alternative assets. Yes. And the concept is you know, if we start with really basic building blocks, you know, the first thing your average person should have is the standard wisdom is you got to have like, you know, 3 or 4 months of cash, right? Basic savings in case you get sick and lose your job, whatever. Yep. And then you start building a little bit of a portfolio. You buy a nice, diversified mutual fund. And over time, if you have um, enough income to make good investments and you know, reasonably good investments, they don't have to be stellar, as your wealth grows um, and you're well diversified. So, so there's, a, there's a concept of being diversified, right? Um, if you own, if all of your money is in Netflix, that's a that's not diversity. Terrible idea. Mm -hmm. If all of your money is in Netflix and um, Uber, now you're at least a little bit diversified. Right. If you put then buy some Lyft, you didn't really you diversified a little bit more, but, but the really. Lyft and Uber are right. so similar. Yeah. Um, so to achieve diversification, the easiest thing for most people is to buy a mutual fund. Right. But you can absolutely or have, a low cost index fund. Right. But you could absolutely have a diversified portfolio of like 20 individual stocks. Yes. Um, In fact, I've heard people say, uh, statistically, once you get to the number 20, 20 individual stocks, you're pretty much going to not be far off from the S&P 500. Um, yeah, I mean, as long as they're not all stocks Correct. in the same industry and all that stuff. 20 drug companies, yeah, right. it's not going to work, right? So, so you might have a very well-diversified stock portfolio, but you may be incredibly undiversified because you're not thinking about if you've never you know bothered reading about this stuff or learning about this stuff there's a whole other level of diversification and it's um so, so stock market investments that's an asset class and the thing about stocks generally even though diversification among stocks is good because one might go up one might go down guess what it's a known truth that generally the market goes up together and goes down together. So even if you've got a well-diversified portfolio or well-diversified mutual funds, index funds, um, if the market takes a big hit, all of the diversification in the world in the, in, in the stock market won't help. Your, your investments will go down. Right. Mm -hmm. But remember, I just said the stock market is an asset class. There are other asset classes completely different from the stock market and those asset classes help, you know, you invest some m money in the stock market, but then you invest in these other buckets, these other asset classes, and now you're diversified among asset classes. So if the stock market goes down, there's no reason these other asset classes, they're not tied to the market. They, right. they you know, they, they'll be, f they, they ought to be completely unrelated to the stock market. And in so some cases, there are asset classes that are absolutely counter, you know, when the market tends to go up, they go down. When the market tends to go down, they go up. Right. So that's their diversification among asset classes. And the way we got to that is I asked Dahmer, you know, have we talked, have you guys talked about private equity? Right. Private equity is a separate asset class and private equity. Um, okay. So you guys know what a mutual fund is? Yeah. A mutual fund, anybody can buy a mutual fund. Mm -hmm. And the mutual fund typically invests in public companies and companies you could buy on the stock market. A private equity fund, um, not anybody can invest in a private equity fund. You have to have a certain amount of um, wealth uh, or income. 
And that's kind of like a paternalistic thing the government turned on like 60 years ago or whatever, because basically they were concerned. The stock market, the nice thing about a stock that trades on the stock market is the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission, there's a lot of disclosure, mandatory disclosure, that there's a lot of you know shining light on these companies yeah. because they have to file. They're like a watchdog. They're a watchdog, and you don't have to be concerned. For the, the the with rare exceptions, there's no there's you know the, the instances of fraud. Right. Um, very rare with public companies. Um, Those are public companies. Public Private companies. equity. Right. Are so, different. Right, and and pub. The other thing about the stock market is if you buy. Um, whatever stock you buy in the stock market, you can sell it the next day. Mm-hmm. So it's liquid. Right. Private Pro- equity is not that way. Right. Private equity is, first of all, you have to be a quote-unquote accredited investor. Um, and you're an accredited investor if you make, uh, I think it's $200,000 a year, three hundred if you're married. Yep. Or if you have a million dollars of assets, not including your house that you right. live in. Your net worth is a million or more. Yeah. If then you, need, you can buy into a private equity fund. Then you fund. can bu- buy into a private equity fund or a venture capital fund. You can be an angel investor. You can do all those things. And, and is where you're going, are you saying that in the private equity funds and the VC funds, those guys, they, they're they well-equipped to read the Daily DAC, your website, right, and scoop up some of those on the cheap, some of those bankruptcy companies or companies that are struggling on the cheap. That's right. Yeah. So gotcha. private equity funds invest in private companies. In fact, they don't invest in private companies. Pretty much, they buy private companies. They like to buy like a hundred percent or pretty darn close to a hundred percent. They buy private companies, and their investors are um, again accredited investors who who invested with them, and um, it's riskier, um, but the but it's completely more, possibly more upside, right? Possibly a lot more upside, and also um, uncor. The word is correlation and uncor uncor correlated and uncorrelated. So, again, um, Uber and Lyft are going to be highly correlated. Right. Uh, stocks, all public stocks. There's a level of correlation, um, but then, in order to combat that, you invest in these other asset classes where there should be little to no Less correlation. correlation. Right. Right. All right. One last question for you. Uh, Give us a deal where you helped, to the extent you can share, what is one deal where you helped creatively using your, your business and law skills help client make a lot of money? Like where, what's one of the most successful deals you participated on and you used a lot of your, you know, your uh, skill to make that client a lot of money? And, th- and that client may not have made all that money if it weren't for you. Um. Well, the story that comes to mind, uh, it, it would be unfair for me to say that I think the client may not have – a, a number of lawyers could have done it, but a number of lawyers probably would have been a little too gun-shy. Okay. Um, in law, law firms in America, by the way, there's a big divide. Like there's the 100 or 200 largest law, law firms in America – um, that you know, service. Uh, they're all they. They only do business. I mean, the two hundred largest. In fact, the five hundred largest law firms in, in the United States. Um, business law. Yeah, pretty much. Don't think you're going to go to them for divorce or family or yeah. or, or, or slip and Your fall. Your will, estate, right? Yeah, the, it's it's business law. And um, uh, a lot. And there's a level of conservative. You know, big firms, right? Um, you know, suit and tie. Uh, conservative yeah, people, white shoe, right? Right, and that's where I I was at uh, Kirkland and Ellis. That's, and that's a That's a one. very big uh, corporate law firm, right? Um, oh, is this where you made that client that money? No, no. Oh. Um, but but uh, in contrast, there's then uh, the wild, wild west, and there's a lot in between. So um, this, so so we're sitting in the city of Chicago and in the state of Illinois. Um, you're welcome for that geography lesson. <laughs> uh. um, and like five or ten years ago, um, the Illinois uh, Illinois as a state legalized video gambling right. in bars. Right. So 15 years ago, if you went to a bar, 
you wouldn't typically see a video poker machine right. where you could bet money. Mm -hmm. Today, it's pretty common. Damn. All throughout the state. Right. And um, for like 50 or more years, uh, it was illegal. It existed, though. I mean, prostitution is illegal, but it exists, right? Sure. So it was... It, it there, there were ga video game video yeah, poker kinda machines hidden almost but kind of hidden often like a back room or whatever right. i'm picturing a lot of cigars italian people sitting around a table right right and and so um it was and if you got caught with one it was a misdemeanor oh okay. so not a t t terribly serious crime just get a thousand dollar fine maybe slap on the wrist right it was tolerated and they called that um you know like the black market yep they called that the it was a gray market because it was tolerated it wasn't right. right so um like five or ten years you know probably closer to ten it's years like ago bootleg video game machines video, um, bootleg video poker machines like bootleg and alcohol back in the day yeah bootlegging. yeah yeah and so um like about a decade ago the government the illinois state government said you know what um people can go to vegas people can go to river boats <laughs> Let's. We know what's happening anyway. Let's, let's legalize. Let's legalize it. it, regulate it, and tax it. Just like smoking marijuana. That's exactly right. So um, what they did was the the state said, okay, here's what we're gonna do. First of all, because this gray market existed, you had hunt maybe hundred hundreds of illegal operators. Right. So they first the government, the Illinois state said, all right, guys. Um, we're making this a, a felony. So mm. you're being warned right now. Stop doing that. Stop shit. doing it. If we catch you, you can't participate when it becomes legal. So we're going to make it a felony for the next, I don't remember, six months, 12 sure. months. And then they um, basically, um, using PR, made it known to the business community that this was going to become legalized. So entrepreneurs came, who had no prior experience with these gambling machines came in to um, to to uh, operate these games. Um, and, Pe and people who were going to make the video game machines? No, that's a different story. The oh. people who are going to own Open, the machines. Own the machines. Yeah. So the way oh, and then maybe rent them out. Yeah. The way the law works is. Um, you have to apply for a license if you're a bar that wants one. Okay. You have to apply for, but you can't own the machines. You have to rent the machines really? from a supplier. Okay. And then there, uh, then there was a second uh, group who, um, and the suppliers, they weren't, al they're not allowed to own bars. They're only oh. allowed to own the machines. So they rent the machines. Interesting. They place the machines in the locations. Gotcha. And the location and the, it's called an oper a terminal operator. Okay. The terminal operator owns the machines. Got it. They place the machines in a location, and they split the profits. Oh, they split the profits. Yeah, they split the profits. Interesting. It's it's um fifty fifty I think on the profits, but Damn. like almost a third goes to the state. Damn. So it's heavily taxed. All right. So how did you help a client make a ton of money? So the story is, and it was sort of one of the more interesting things in my in my legal career. I was used to dealing with very big numbers and big companies. And my client was um, and is still a client and owns a number of businesses. And this guy said, I think I want to get into this. And the way to get into it, and a lot, a number of people said that at the time. And the way to get into it was um, you could go, remember there were these illegal operators. You could go, the government actually said this is okay. You could go to the illegal operators and say, I'd like to buy your route. Because usually the illegal operators um, they didn't own the, the the individual bars. They didn't own their machines either. Mm. They got them from a terminal operator, an illegal terminal operator. And so you might have a terminal operator that had twenty bars. You know, they their machines were in twenty bars. You might have another terminal operator that their machines were in a hundred bars, whatever. And there were dozens, scores, or even hundreds of these guys throughout the state. So the government basically gave these operators a as long as you don't get caught operating once we tell you it's a felony, you can apply to be a terminal operator. Although so many of them had sketchy records, they didn't get approved. Ah. Or they knew they wouldn't get approved. They thought they wouldn't get approved. Or B, you can sell your route 
your illegal route to a new guy to a new guy and that will be legal your guy well, was the new guy and so my guy was one of the new guys smart and so but in order to do these deals you know most deals i do happen in you know um conference rooms and courtrooms and you know with suits and ties yep. and, and stuff like that where was this one well we bought a number of routes from a number of these operators yeah and so it involved going into like the back you know we made appointments i mean we didn't just walk in um you know connections were made and then we walked into these dark bars into the back room and there was a very tough looking guy or guys mm -hmm. who you know we would talk to um one of the biggest routes we bought we and and a lot of this stuff was not in the city of chicago i don't even know if they're legal in the city of chicago yet mm, um maybe not. because originally chicago um didn't, maybe just suburbs they didn't opt out Ah, they didn't opt into the law gotcha. or they opted out of the law. So a lot of these machines and these bars, they're located in all the rural areas where there's ah. not, a, not a lot to do for entertainment. Except mm -hmm. video poker machines. Yeah. So <laughs> anyway, um, the, you know, a, a, the, the one experience I'll never forget is we're, we're sitting in the country, you know, in some, uh, not a suburb, but like the country. Peoria kind of thing. Wherever. And, um, we're in the guy's backyard, and after we shoot some guns on his gun range, um, and and his you know friends come by, and you know they're um, rough and tumble. I mean, it was a lot of motorcycles involved. <laughs> Motorcycle um, tattoos. And uh, so we we wrote a term sheet on you know the back of like a napkin. Um, <laughs> You know, and he signed. They signed the terms on the back Damn. of the napkin, and it was just a whole different um, type of conduct that you typically, when you go to a good law school and then you go into a big law firm, you don't deal with this kind Hell of stuff. That's no, the last thing you do. And again, the point is that I don't think it took particular legal acumen, but I think a lot of people. Um, wouldn't have gone into that. Situation. They wouldn't have gone into it. Right. Did you? And how much money did you help that guy make? Um, he makes a lot of money. Yeah, he makes a lot off those current machines he now owns routes on. Yes. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. That's a cool story. Yeah. That's, not I shy. Mean, not shy to go down into the. Uh, I mean, lawyers the, are boring. Um, so that's about as that's exciting, exciting as, yeah, as, right, as I right, get. Right. right. Um, cool. That was John Freeland, y'all. That was amazing. We got ourselves a, a a legal mastermind here, so I appreciate that, John. Um, we were going to get to Facebook. We are we are not going to do Facebook today. We'll pick that up at a later time, possibly. Uh, but thanks for being here, John. I appreciate your uh, insights and bankruptcy expertise. Thank you for having me. St. James, thank you for being here, brother. Of course. Thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah. And Chris, producing the hell out of the show, y'all. Yeah. Thanks for listening, right. y'all. Peace out. Peace. Peace.